Hey, welcome back to the shop. Today we have another cheap Chinese piece of tooling that we're going to take apart and take a closer look at. Uh, like I did with my rotary table and with the cheap 100mm recharge chuck. Last time when I did um, the teardown with the 100mm recharge chuck, I got a lot of flack from people because um, they said you shouldn't buy cheap tooling because it's crap. For a lot of people, buying a piece of industrial hardware is not an option. You buy a room or a shunk or a four card three chart chuck and you spend thousand, two thousand, three thousand bucks just for the chuck. That's about the budget of the average hobbyist that he will invest in a lathe and in a mill and in some tooling. So give me a break. Um, of course, it's nice to have a nice Mitutoyo dial caliper. It's nice to have a, a buck six jaw chuck, but for a lot of hobbyists, it's just not an option. And I want to show that you can get value out of a cheap piece of tooling if you are willing to invest a bit of time if you're willing to learn, if you're willing to fiddle around with it. This time we have a 5C horizontal vertical indexer. Um, this thing still gets sold by Hardinge. Um, costs new about 10,000 bucks. This one comes <laughs> directly from China. I bought it from Kronos in the UK. Got a bit of a, a Brexit bargain there and it works out of the box. I, I just took it apart once to clean, all, clean it up completely and I used it already and it works very well and um, I like it so far. Nothing to complain about it. If you're not familiar with these, these are for um, for rapid indexing. You can set up to uh, 24 divisions on the dividing plate here. And then with the ratchet you can index on. Right now it's set to 45 degree indexing. So pressing down this lever, turning 45 degree. 90, 135, 180 and so on and so on. Um, it takes 5C collets and it has a, a big hunting thread for a, for a chuck back plate, which um, <laughs> I might never use. Be aware that this indexer is quite big. On a, on a mini mill or something like that, this thing is too big. Um, on my milling machine, it's on the edge of being uh, <laughs> being too big. If my mill was only slightly smaller, I would have bought this. Um, it stands up from the table. About 200 millimeters up to the nose. Um, the collet is, is clamped by this quick action lever. Just you screw the collet in, which is a bit hard when it's in upright position. And then you can just with this lever clamp the um, clamp the collet and your workpiece with it. The nice thing about the 5C collet is um, you get a wide variety of collets. You can get normal straight cylindrical bores. You get emergency collet that you can bore to size. You get internal clamping collet. You get square hex. You get everything. Um, you get even back plates that have a five for chucks that have a 5C um, shank on them. Or you can get a 5C to ER collet adapter. So there is pretty much everything out there that you can imagine. Okay, let's take this off the machine and go to the bench. Okay, I brought the indexer over to my bench and this is normal position for horizontal work and you can stand up on the back side to do vertical work. 
um, both of the surfaces are, <clears throat> I would call it, scraped. They are, I think they grind these surfaces and then they do a, a light flaking. We will check the, if these surfaces are square to each other and also if, if the spindle is in line with it. Okay, we're over at my tiny surface plate and I clamp up a 10 millimeter dial pin in a, in a 10 millimeter collet and I checked it for another, it runs about one hundredth of a millimeter. And now I'm going to check if the spindle is in line with the with the bottom surface of this indexing head. <coughs> so I already searched the high spot over here, close to the close to the collar chuck. And search again for the high spot. And we have about plus two hundredths of a millimeter. That's one thousandth of an inch about, roughly. That means over a distance of 60 millimeters we are rising two hundredths of a millimeter. That's not terrible good, but also not terrible bad. Um, you have to decide for yourself if that's good enough or not. Um, right now for me that's... I think it's fine because I'm not intending to do half meter long shafts with this indexer. Next thing that we can check is when we stand it upright. Um, if the rear surface is square to this surface, and we can use my squareness comparator for that. Okay, setting my squareness comparator to zero using my big reference square. Searching for... Okay, that's zero. Let's get it out of the way and check again. And that's still zero. And now we can check it against the surface. <laughs> um, I hope the travel of the 2000s indicator is enough. Woohoo! Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, over here we have plus 2.8 hundredths of a millimeter. Or <laughs> let's do it the neat way. Um, 28 thousandths of a millimeter, or as some people like to call it, microns. Point. Three thirty-two micron. That's also not terrible good, but also not terrible bad. Um, you have to keep in mind that this guy costs uh, a hundred and something euros, including shipping. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, I consider the Chinese um, Chinese Chinese tooling pretty much a kit. A kit of castings and machine pre-machined parts. All the hard work is done, you just have to make it precise. And the more measurements I take, um, the more I think I should do a complete makeover on this thing. Just like I did with the angle table, where I still have to edit the last video. Okay, I clamped the indexer to my the table of my milling machine. I'm checking the run out on a clamped dial pin. Just a, a hardened ground 10 mm dial pin in a collet, and I have a 100 of a millimeter per division indicator up here. So let's disengage the index pin and give it a whirl. And as you can see, there is not much movement while I'm turning. 
let's call it for sake of whatever uh, one hundredth of a millimeter run out directly behind the collet. Okay, it's not too bad out here too. So run out is not an issue uh, or not a, a very very bad issue at all. Uh, that's something I can live with. So. Now let's finally take this guy apart. Take it to the bench and take it apart. Okay, let's start to take this guy apart. First we take off this small cover with the circ fitting because that will show you how the index pin works. Okay, there we go. Under the circ fitting we have a gear and this is an idler gear. Um, you can see when I this over here is the ratchet handle. When I press in the pin to release the index pin on the other side, the idler gear in here rotates. And the reason for that is take out the this is the idler gear. Hardened. That's nice. Um, when you take a look inside, you can see that both of the pins have gear teeth cut into them. And that way, when, when this rack moves in, it spins the idler wheel and pulls, pulls in the, other, the, the indexing pin on the other side. That way they are reversing the direction now, the, the direction of movement. You push this pin in and the index pin on the other side moves out of the index plate. Now it might be a good idea to pull out the, the quick action lever here for the collet, for the draw tube. It's hinged of two stepped bolts. We can remove the lever and pull out the, the draw tube. Um, I already had this guy completely apart and I cleaned everything and I decided to do a short video on this thing because you don't see them that often. A lot of people have them and, I, and you see them a lot in uh, production environments, um, especially the, <laughs> the non-Chinese variant of this guy. Okay, this is the rear side of the of the indexing spindle and here you see the 24 hole indexing plate. And you might notice that the uh, that the holes are threaded. And in each of these holes is a set screw and by screwing in by 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 screwing in the set screw all the way um, you can mask off holes, so you can make this a 12-hole indexing plate or a 4-hole indexing plate. Or what I have right now, I have 1, 2, 8. Now this is an 8-hole this uh, dividing plate right now because all other, there are only 8 screws backed up. All the other screws between them are screwed down, bottomed out. Uh, not completely bottom up. If you screw them in completely, you lock it. I think that's the same on the hard end unit. So that's that's quite neat. Okay, I got the dividing plate loosened up, and I can take it out of the off the spindle, and then we can just pull out the whole spindle with the ratchet assembly here. Get this out of the way for a second. The ratchet can just be pulled off. Should come off that way. And then we have the spindle, which is rather nicely made. Um, it has this large tapered bearing here. These are the indentations for the ratchet mechanism in this, in this uh, ring here 
and back here is a cylindrical portion where the index plate mounts. So uh, rather nicely made and we take a needle file and we, we check the hardness in a minor spot. It's not glass hard, it's hardened, but not glass hard. We will break out the hardness testing files to check it anyway. So um, I think that spindle is not too bad. Okay, let's uh, try to see if we can check for hardness on the spindle. I have my hardness testing files. And we start with the 65 Rockwell file, which will grab I'm sure. Um, I'm using this diameter here for checking because it's not a, um, because this is no functional surface. So 65 grabs, 60 grabs, 55 grabs 50 starts to slip 45 this is getting pretty soft <laughs> uh, okay um, this is 45 rock welds and this slips so we are between 45 and 50 Rockwell. So it's not super hard, but it's <laughs> it's a lot tougher than mild steel. <clears throat> it has seen some heat treating, that's for sure. And I think, yeah, while while it's not super hard, it's for me in the hobby shop. This should be good enough. Um, normally, when you insert a a collet into a taper seat you you do anyway the wipe routine so should work out and here we have again the the indexing pin the idler wheel and the actuating pin for the for the indexing and uh, when the index the actuating pin that's lower one moves in and the idler wheel stays in place the the indexing pin moves back so that's a mechanical reversing so that's quite neat um, <laughs> i like it Ooh, these are these guys are super hard So um, that's 50, doesn't grab, 55 grabs in some spot. That tells me that the, the heat treating is not very even. At all, but uh, it's hard, <laughs> but it's hard. So same for the gear, um, 55 barely grabs. 50 HRC slips. So those components are hardened. Uh, <laughs> um, they are hard. Okay, now we get back to the casting. And as you can see in here, we have the, the tapered bearing, plain bearing for the spindle. And they scraped, <laughs> they scraped it. Um, let's, let's break out some high spot blue and check the taper for fit. As I don't want to end up as the as a member of the Blue Man Group today, I'm wearing gloves. I degreased the casting, and I also um, I'm using some I'm using some denatured alcohol to get any oil off the spindle. Otherwise, it can mess with the bluing. Um, and we take a small piece of uh, shot towel and an even smaller dab of high spot blue. Uh, bluing a taper is not as easy as it sounds. Um, 
I'm spreading the high spot blue. I try to get a very thin coat. Maybe, maybe I need a little bit more. Okay, let's let's touch you off. No, I'm just joking. This is way too much color. Um, that way you won't be able to get any reading of the um, of your spot of your of your print because everything's blue. So. Take a clean, clean spot of the rag and we wipe it down and try to get it somewhat even like this. This looks better. And I take our casting and we pull it out. And then we take a close look inside the bore. Okay, let's check it. We we have some we have a high spot here. We have one down here. I'm marking them with a with a, with a felt pen because they show up very very bad on camera. Okay. okay, that's the front bearing seat and keep in mind that I had very little uh, high spot blue on my taper. So we get we got an even pattern all around on the yeah very bad but even pattern all around. Let's turn this guy around. And the rear bearing it's actually better. Um, we have large areas here. So the rear bearing seat, pretty good. Sorry for the bad video job there. Um, but filming a, a print on a, on a surface or a high spot, high spot blue on a, a scraped surface is hard as it is already. And it's even harder when you try to do it inside a bore. In a in a uh, in a casting, so um, the taper seat is not it's not perfect by any means, but it's it's bearing all around and not that bad. Um, if it wasn't for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't bother with it. But uh, being who I am, of course, I <laughs> I have to scrape the. The, the tapered bearing of this dividing head uh, might be. I never, I never scraped the tapered bearing, so this might be interesting for me. And as long as I have the camera running, it might be also interesting for you. Um, back here, we see the surface where the um, dividing plate rides up against, and it's uh, it's a perfect, perfectly fine machining job. Uh, they sleeve this, uh, this the bore for the index pin up here. I'm not sure why they do this, but it might be. I hope it's a hard bushing. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a hard bushing for the indexing pin. That's a very good. That's a very nice touch. So um, you don't wear out the bore for the index pin. And in this shot, you can see the the, the scraping surface of uh, the scraped surface of this uh, indexing head again, and it's not. It looks not terrible bad. Um, it's if you if you take a close look at it, it's definitely surface ground and then just flaked. Um, the flaking looks better than my flaking. But um, the surface below it is not perfectly even, so uh, I think I'm going to do a complete rebuild of the sky, <laughs> uh, just because it's interesting for me 
in the end I hope to replace this um, this plaque with made in Germany. Okay, I hope you enjoyed this teardown of another Chinese piece of tooling. And remember what I said in the beginning. Of course you can buy a brand new hard inch indexer or go and buy a Fibrotech uh, a rotary table or a Walter rotary table. Um, they are expensive but you don't have to do anything to them out of the box. They will just be perfect. Hence the price. But for hobbyists it's often not an option to buy a 10,000 euro rotary table. Um, we buy a 150 or 250 buck rotary table and try to make the best of it. So think about that. Thanks for watching. See you next time.